Continuing with assignment two, I had just started sketching and labeling maybe the different areas where I would work on my inspiration animals anatomy, trying to build it in real life. So why do we need to do this? Why do we need to sketch out an idea before we start looking for reference? We need to do that so that it looks dimensional, so the animal can actually be moved later. We will have the option of animating it, building kind of a skeletal structure that we can animate with puppet warp. And if we don't, if we work on a sketch that's not based on anatomy, no matter how good we are at lighting and matching textures, the creature is just not going to feel usable in the same way. So, yeah, so this is a fun kind of design practice exercise of what we're doing, where you take kids' drawings and you try to make them as believable as you can using your digital skills. So you'll see this all over the internet. And it's just hilarious, right? I love the tail that has an extra tail. And we want this kind of creativity, but we also really want to, to believe where, where the rib cage can go and what the shape of the rib cage is and where the hips go. So that's why I like Pokemon as an inspiration. You can use Greek mythology as an inspiration. You can use, you know, insects or any kind of crazy combination of, of imagery out there. But every concept creature that's ever been created is some variation of something that exists in the world, right? Is some combination or strange. We've seen too many kind of cockroach aliens in pop culture, you know, but certain things become trendy. We've seen too many like lizard kind of aliens. And my son was asking, why don't they ever have just kind of furry creatures? And the truth is because you'll learn by doing this, fur is tough but it's especially tough to animate in CG. And we've gotten better and better at it. <laughs> and, and now now they're able to do King Kong very well. That's not a puppet, you know, that's all CG. But it just takes a lot more work. So more and more becomes possible with the technology. But for this, you can just do anything you want. So even though I'm inspired by the silhouette and the anatomy of this Pokemon creature, I get to make it a reality with any kind of textures, colors that I want. But there are some pretty big limitations once you have your sketch. And the main limitation is the angle of the anatomy. So I started, oh, let me grab my tablet here, because I am very slow writing out things, sketching words with uh, my trackpad. But I put pig ears there because I thought, yeah, those kind of look like pig ears. And then that mouth, I really actually like the open mouth. I don't know if I like the buck teeth so much. That makes it a little bit too much just like a, a rat or a mouse for my taste. But I'm going to, after I've done my skeletal sketch, I'm going to just start brainstorming just in real time. What are some textures? What are some elements I can use. So for like the open mouth, maybe I use a cow, right? All of these will have question marks or uh, some sort of braying animal like a donkey, or if I want there to be teeth, but they can be different kinds of teeth, right? Maybe a lion, but I'm gonna make the mouth kind of a focal point like it is on this silhouette that helps activate the anatomy. I like the the weird feet, you know, maybe for those, a rhinoceros, for the kind of limited toed creature. And that will make it feel like it has more weight, right? Because if you actually look at mice feet and rat feet, which these are not based on, they're just so tiny, they kind of disappear into the creature's silhouette. And then I really like the spikes you know, the spikes on the back, and maybe those can be done with, with horns of some sort, or maybe even like beetle prongs. And then I really like the spots. And so 
I'm thinking maybe some sort of mushroom cap. Because organic textures are organic textures. And we can combine feather, fur, scale, mushrooms. <laughs> you know, pine cone is a texture I use a lot in my creature designs. And he's really soft here. The transitions are important. You know, between the neck and the, the chest, this is always tricky. I want something really furry and soft. So maybe like a puppy. So you have the, the contrast, which I like in my designs a lot, between sharp and weird and fuzzy and soft and small. So these are the kind of inspirations. We only need five different sources minimum, but we generally will have a lot more than that. So I'll update my sketch. Now I've got those ideas. And now I have to source those image, images. And I've started to do it. And my favorite, as you guys know, is Pixabay for finding these things. So if I go to Pixabay, I log in with my email and I just look up mouse, right? Pixabay will have a lot of mice. Some of them are gonna be really helpful. I can open them in a new tab, and then when I look at the actual photo, I want to make sure everything is, is sharp and in focus. So notice how the tail is out of focus because this is a, a macro lens. So what's useful for this? Well, that, that head is useful, but is the head in the right position? If I use this head, would I be able to make the mouth a focal point? Not really. It's not tilted right. It is at a three-quarter, but it's just it's tilted down instead of up. So you can accept or reject when you see them in full, but realize you want everything to be sharp and in focused and at the right angle. You can always flip it horizontally, but I can't get the underside of this mouse's jaw from this reference. So it can be a pain, you know, searching. And that's why maybe mice aren't the best thing. because there aren't that many photos of mice with their mouths open. So I might look up something like lion mouth. And sure enough, I get some nice lion mouths, open and dramatic. 48 of them. And when I choose one, I open it. I make sure the, the element I want is in sharp focus. Now that head is nothing like my creature. You know, the muzzle is so much shorter, but this could be the, the nose and the mouth and the chin of my creature. And it's got nice fuzzy material here that can transition into another head shape. So I'm gonna download that. You guys are just beginning compositing with fantasy creatures. What I like to do is I always make the head out of at least three creatures because the head is the focal point of the body and of the creature. And I don't want the head, I, I basically don't want, oh, it's the head of a lion on the body of something else, right? So I want it to make it harder to place. So I'm gonna replace the eye, I'm gonna replace the head, but the mouth and the jaw I'm gonna use from this lion. And then I might warp it and resize it. So I download it. What if you can't find what you want on Pixabay because it is more limited? Well, you are allowed to use Google Images. And our, so the biggest advantage of using Pixabay is not that it has the most images. It's that everything on there is Creative Commons open. So you are allowed to use that those copyrighted images without infringing on anyone's rights. They've donated them for that purpose. And you don't, you don't ever need to attribute to them. You never say this was created by Coffee Bean 47. Instead, you get to, to use it, you get to adapt it, you get to change it. We're gonna learn all about Creative Commons, the different types and copyright and all the different considerations when using copyrighted images with question of the day two. And that's chapter two in your reading. And it's really the only reading that's not optional for the course because it's just some good legal information there. And we'll discuss it in class. 
Google Images is a free-for-all. This will give us millions of images instead of hundreds. And if I look for something like bat, I'm going to get a lot more bat ear options than I did with Pixabay. The problem is you should assume that everything you find on Google is owned by someone, copyrighted, and that it's backed by a corporation, which is more and more true, that has bots scouring the internet for infringements on its copyrights. And you don't want to invite lawsuits. You don't want to invite problems. And the short answer is as students making work for an assignment where you're learning, you are covered under fair use and you don't need to worry about that. But as college students trying to make a professional level portfolio, you should start treating your work as professional work right away, which allows you to promote yourself with it, allows you to, to sell it. So you should forget that whole student educational fair use clause and just be a professional. So we'll learn how to do that. But that doesn't mean that Google images are off limits. It just means you have to use them with the intention of transforming them so that they are no longer recognizable by internet bots or by the human eyes, right? And it's good to really transform your references anyway. So if I find some bat ears, oh gosh, that's just dramatic and otherworldly. I like that. The problem is I need to make sure that it's big enough. So sadly, this image is only 430 by 360 pixels. So how can I make Google image search a little bit more useful? We've done this before. Not only do, do, do I do images, but I go to more and I want to use the tools. So if I click on tools, I can limit it by size. And I want the size to be only large size images of bat ears. And I can even click on usage rights and say Creative Commons licenses. And that shouldn't be enough to protect you. You know, you have to if you really want to worry about the license, you still have to do your due diligence. But th this will limit Google significantly, even more than Pixabay in a lot of instances. Though Pixabay images should theoretically show up here. So I'm going to take off the Creative Commons license and only look at the large. And then I have to open them in a new tab and I have to look at them up close. And sure enough, this is from a stock site. This is a corporation that makes money selling its images. These are the last people you want to steal from, but these are the first people as a professional you might buy the image from, right? So if you're working in marketing, if you're working in, in PR and graphic design, you need to create a quick newsletter all about bat ears. Instead of having to create your own bat creature, you could just buy this image for you know $150 for a one-time use kind of thing. But this is not great for what we're doing in class because I don't want to have that watermark over everything, even though it is over a thousand pixels. And that's going to be true of all of these stock sites. So Google used to be a fantastic tool, but it's gotten more and more burdensome as corporations know that everyone looks for things on Google Images. Wow. Yeah, trademarks are way more enforceable than copyrights. And the message to us is like, you better take this off right now, or uh, Gerber's going to come after you. Yeah. Yeah. What's nice about corporations is mostly you just get cease and desist letters from yeah. their lawyers. <laughs> very, very seldom are they going to go over an individual, like, freelance creator for damages, right? But they're going to stop you in your tracks before you oh, get very did. far. We sell military clothing, so. Yeah. They're like, So I found this nice one. It is 1,900 by 1,200. It's some nice wing reference too, but I, I'm interested in the, the ears. So I'm going to look at it, open the image in a new tab so I can see it at full resolution and make sure it's a good quality image. And I can see that the bat would just ate a moth. Nice little detail there. But I'm gonna steal that ear. I like that ear. 
and steel might be too harsh. I'm going to appropriate that year as inspiration for what it will become. 